Hello, I am Jess Jeffcott, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a talk about Colchester, a bit of its heritage. Um, I've got a series of pictures here that I'll run through, and just uh, let's have a little bit of a talk about uh, really the Colchester from the beginnings, really, 2000s of, 2,000 years of history. Um, our first picture here. Uh, shows warriors. Um, this is one of the pictures created by Peter Frost on behalf of the Colchester Archaeological Trust and it it shows really a depiction of how Julius Caesar uh, described the ancient Britons or the Britons um, from the first century really uh, BC uh, how they their battle tactics, how they would uh, ride on chariots and uh, rush out and attack and rush back again and swap horses and do whatever. Um, in this particular instance, uh, in a place called Camulodunum, Camulodunum, uh, known really from coin evidence, uh, you can see two coins there in the bottom corner, uh, minted, these ones, uh, gold staters. Uh, minted by Cunobelin, leader of the uh, Trinovanti tribe, who was centred around Colchester, as we know it today. I suppose, loosely, Essex, uh, as we know it today. Um, this was uh, Trinovanti country, and we were closely allied to the Catuvaloni tribe, uh, which is to the west of us, um, the sort of St Albans area, the two tribes, the Trinovantes and the Catavalloni, both mentioned by Julius Caesar uh, during uh, his failed attempt to uh, conquer or, or whatever he was up to when he came across in 54 BC, 55 BC. He tried it twice and both times he was opposed by uh, the British. Um, two uh, characters, main characters that I'm going to talk about, I suppose, are uh, Tasciovanus, who has coin evidence um, of his presence here, and uh, he was really the Catuvalloni, but I think we identify Cunobelin, his son Cunobelin, as uh, king, leader, whatever, of the Trinovantes in Camulodunum. They as a tribe, uh, created these Iron Age earthworks, or dikes, as we know them. In fact, they exist today, very much so, if you know where to look in the Gosbex area of Colchester. Uh, you can see there the people up on the dikes there and the gaps between them, uh, which, of course, the, the British um, warriors would take advantage of. Uh, no armour. Um, they would wear blue woad to make themselves look fearsome, bearded, um, uh, spiky hair. So moving on to the next picture. Um, King Cunobelin died around about the year 40. Um, always a belligerent leader, I think, uh, constantly attacking uh, harassing other tribes, neighbouring tribes across the whole of Britain. Of course, the tribal system existed right across Britain. And they each had their own name, Brigantes, uh, Atrobates. Um, of course, the Iceni to the north, uh, famous for Bodicea. I'll talk about her in a minute. Um, so this picture here shows us the Romans arriving well, this is on Abbey Fields a few years back, uh, a reenactment group, the uh, 20th Legion, who came um, really uh, a lot to do with the fact that Cunobelin, Cunobelin's sons, after he died, were harassing other tribes, and Verica, King Verica of the Atrobates, uh, the sort of Surrey area to, today, appealed to Rome for help. Uh, there had clearly been um, trading links with, with the Roman Empire, as, of course, the coins use um, Roman uh, lettering and, number, and numbers. So um, 
the Roman system was being adopted in the coinage, but of course Britain then was not part of the Roman Empire. Uh, but it soon was to become in the year 43 when the Emperor Claudius responded uh, to requests from Britain and um, taking advantage of a period of uncertainty in Britain with these warring sons and um, tribal conflicts, arrived in 43 and made a beeline for this place called Camulodunum. There he took the surrender of 11 British kings or tribal leaders. Uh, that's well documented. He came here. He didn't go anywhere else. Of course, London was yet to uh, exist. In fact, London must have been a serious problem to the Romans because they would have landed in what we know as Dover today and uh, made their way across. And they had to get across the Thames. Of course, there were no bridges in those days. So however they managed it, we don't know. Allegedly, they came with elephants, um, according to the, uh, the, old, the old writings. But uh, whatever happened, they arrived in Camulodunum, took the surrender of the British, and began their conquest to, uh, to conquer um, Britannia. Uh, of course, they never managed to conquer Britain because uh, they couldn't uh, deal effectively with, with the troublesome Scots, the Caledonians in the north, which, of course, ultimately... Um, led to the building of Hadrian's Wall, but we're getting ahead of ourselves here. So so the Romans came in 43, um, and they constructed a fortress. Um, clearly they couldn't be too trustful of the British, um, although the British seem to have settled down under Roman rule. Obviously they brought order, and uh, if you stepped out of line, you would be punished. So this next... Uh, picture shows us a modern day map overlaid with uh, what the archaeologists know about what was left from 2,000 years ago from the, from the ancient British who constructed this dike system. You can see all these heavy lines there laid out and many if not most of those um, lines um, are in evidence today, if you know where to look. Scheduled ancient monument, probably one of the biggest scheduled ancient monuments in the country, uh, is the whole of this area known as Gosbecks, with all its dike system. And um, you can see there shown the Roman colonia, which was established on a on a hillside that uh, could overlook uh, could overlook the British. Um, this looks like a series of lines, doesn't look particularly like a, uh, the most powerful um, British settlement, which is, indeed is exactly what it was. Cunobelin's um, uh, tribe was the most powerful uh, place in Britain at the time. So you've got these dikes really defending Camulodunum from attacks from the west, and of course the River Cone was a natural barrier to the north, the Roman River as we know it today, to the south, and of course to the, to the east you had the sea. So this is a pretty uh, effective way of protecting yourself against attack. Um, you can see their burial sites at uh, Stanway, um, which were uncovered when um, Tarmac came in to take the gravel out. Um, of course, Abbotstone as well is another area that was excavated as part of the gravel works. And of course, you can see from there how Colchester expanded, um, or has expanded over the, the centuries since those times. Um, but of course, these uh, scheduled ancient monuments are very heavily protected by English heritage, as they should be. And... Uh, well worth going to find them. Uh, also shown there, of course, is the later road to what became London. So moving on to our next picture, we have uh, a burning temple of Claudius. Now this, uh, this relates to a lady named Bodicea, uh, who found herself queen 
of the Iceni tribe to the north of us, uh, the Norfolk area. Her husband, Prasutagas, died, and um, Bodicea was presented with the Romans turning up uh, and looking for the return of the money that they say they, they lent the tribe, which, of course, had been seen as a gift rather than a loan, but, uh, of course, they had no way to pay. And uh, the, so the stories go... Uh, the Iceni were duffed up quite badly, uh, and Bodicea's daughters ravished. They used the word ravished. There's no such uh, Latin word for rape, but, of course, uh, it's assumed that her daughters were raped, and, of course, this enraged uh, Bodicea and her people. Um, in fact, since the year 43, some 17 years, uh, the Romans had been in power, and, of course, they'd uh, delivered their own sort of uh, culture forced it upon the Romans, uh, sorry, forced it upon the, the British, um, uh, allowing the British to live their old way of life, but at the same time uh, requiring uh, taxes and uh, work from them in return, and of course taking their land as well to give to um, the retired Roman soldiers. Uh, Colchester became, had become a colonia since '43. A colonia being a place where retired Roman uh, uh, soldiers could settle uh, whilst uh, being relied upon, really, to look, look after Rome's interests. And, of course, they would settle and be given lands, the lands, uh, of course, coming from the, from the British uh, people there. Um, so there was a degree of upset. Uh, so uh, sufficient enough for Bodicea to be able to, again, according to... Um, Roman um, historical writers like Tacitus and uh, uh, Dio Cassius, uh, she was able to raise an army of about 150,000, and um, they descended onto Colchester to, to wreak their vengeance. And here we have a picture of her arrival um, in Camulodunum and the destruction even today, archaeologists digging down in the in the Colonia Centre uh, will come to a burnt layer, which they can accurately date to this time of 60 or 61, not too sure. Bodicea, of course, was well known as such um, throughout our history, but of course it looks now as if it was a spelling error and it should have been Boudicca. You only have to move two of the letters to see how easy it would have been for our Victorian transcribers to, to miss that. So she was really Boudicca, but most people call her Bodicea. Um, a hero, perhaps, or was she uh, she, was, she was an enemy? Tacitus tells us that 30,000 people were killed during this uh, attack. Colchester was undefended. Um, the legions were off uh, looking for trouble uh, uh, over in Cornwall and uh, across to Anglesey. Uh, where the Druids were, and uh, of course it took some time for the Romans to respond to this. Uh, but in the meantime, after Colchester, Bodicea went on to London. Now, within probably a year after the Romans arrived in Camulodunum, they realised that strategically it was of no use to them at all. Um, it, the importance was that it was the it was where the the most powerful tribe was. But of course. Um, from, there, from then on, they needed to have a power base, and they chose London. So London very soon started to build up, especially when they could get a bridge across the river uh, and uh, the trading links could be properly established. So uh, Colchester settled down um, into this retirement home, really, for Roman soldiers. And um, so Bodicea went on to London, destroyed it, and then went... Uh, to Verulamium, which was another um, British settlement that became a, a Roman municipia. Municipia it wasn't a colonia; it's, uh, it was a general uh, settlement. Destroyed that. Of course, that that's uh, St Albans as we know it today. Uh, and then she went off, and I think by that time um, the Romans had caught up with her. And uh, history, of course, is written uh, by the victors and uh, Tacitus and Dio Cassius cannot uh, agree between themselves how, how she died, but die horribly, I'm sure she did. Um, and after that, of course, uh, the, the Britons were brutally suppressed 
and uh, their way of life changed after them. Um, the uh, records of the different tribal uh, tribal names uh, sort of started to disappear, were no longer heard of anymore. People became Romano-British, um, and they effectively they were Romans. So, uh, moving on to the next picture, we've got a plan here. Another, uh, I should say that previous picture was another one of Peter Frost's creations, and the inset is a. Uh, from the window of the town hall uh, depicting Bodicea. Um Sorry, moving on to this next picture, uh, we see there another one of Peter Frost's uh, creations of the Colonia, uh, as if um, a bird had a camera and could look down. This is a, quite a recent creation, actually, because the original one uh, was done when we didn't realise that we had a Roman circus, which, of course... We proudly have now. Uh, the Colonia Victricensis, as it was known, the v city of victory, was how it was uh, depicted in the year 43, uh, described rather, but of course it soon became Camula Dunum, a part of the whole complex of the, the British, which was to come to include the Colonia. So we see there an archaeologist's uh, map of how the colonia was set out, it was a it was a clean canvas. They built, they built the colonia on a on a hillside and uh, north, south, east, west. Our high street, of course, is uh, probably the the oldest uh, high street in in the country. And this is where civilization civilization began. Um, after uh, Bodicea's attack, um, it was decided it might be a good idea to put some walls around the colonia, which of course they did. In the in the 80s AD, uh, it's believed, and of course those walls still exist today, in uh, varying state of uh, uh, decay and repair. But of course, one thing the Romans didn't leave us was a was a contract for the ongoing maintenance of their wall. But uh, the map there shows you all sorts of features. It shows you the the grid layout of the streets. Again, uh, high street uh, north. Uh, uh, North Street, um, sorry, North Hill, um, and then you've got Head Street and uh, so many other streets there that have um, we've followed uh, through the centuries and, and kept. There's marks of drainage there, of course. The Romans brought a lot of new things uh, with the civilization that they placed uh, upon the uh, on the British. You know, sewage system, for instance. We've got drains all the way around there. Um, the sewerage was treated quite differently by the Romans, very differently. Of course, what they didn't have here, because this was originally a, a, a fortress, uh, they didn't have water. The fortress was built there to keep an eye on things as a defensive post, but it turned into a colonia. So they must have had serious problems with lack of water there. Um, so Cam this is Camula Dunum, probably in the year 200 or something like that, so A.D., um, and of course, the the name Camula Dunum disappeared uh, after Bodicea's attack, really, and started to be known as um, Colchester, which really came from Colonia Siastra, which means a colonia and a, and a fortress, and and moulded together to become Colchester in the goodness of time. But uh, we're uncertain. Um, of course, eventually the the Romans had trouble back in home, back at home, and uh, they left in the year 410. So 350 odd years of occupation brought us many places in Britain that end with the word Chester. You've got Manchester, Porchester, Dorchester, um, so many uh, different uh, places, and of course the roads that the Romans uh, constructed and that uh, we still are used today as, as general routes. Of course the road surfaces have changed somewhat and they've straightened, uh, straightened out a few things. Um, so moving on to the next uh, picture, we, we have the news in 2004 of a Roman chariot track being found. The military in Colchester found new barracks, uh, Nerville barracks, and the old Victorian barracks were given over for house building. 
the last thing poor old Taylor Wimpy wanted uh, to learn was that a Roman chariot track was found. But of course, whenever anything new like this happens in Colchester, English heritage requires that the archaeologists check it out first. Um, archaeologists had known about various bits of this track, but they didn't know it was a, uh, a chariot track until they started to explore further. And of course, today we now have a wonderful place um, uh, that is the headquarters of the Colchester Archaeological Trust that oversees this um, chariot and uh, the explanation about it. Uh, it believed to be Hadrianic from the uh, second century. Um, an incredible building. I, I haven't got talked. Uh, haven't got time to t go into detail now, but uh, that's the subject of a separate talk. But if you come to Colchester, go to Roman Circuit Circus House and find out about this this amazing place. The next picture is a modern day picture with an inset, really looking to show you this amazing uh, Roman wall that was constructed after Boadicea's attack. 3,100 metres of, of wall constructed uh, from materials that were available. There's no natural building rock in Essex, so what they did have is a thing called septaria, a product called uh, septaria, sort of um, not particularly hard fossilised clay that uh, they harvested from the beaches, from Walton, Harwich, that sort of area, and had to drag back. Then, of course, they had a lot of boulder clay, this red clay that, and a lot of trees in the whole area, covered in forest all over. So they had the makings of brick, and, of course, the lime and the chalk, which must have been brought up who knows where from, Kent perhaps, and uh, had to be burnt to create the, the mortar. So they built this amazing wall structure, and we can see in this picture in the middle at the bottom the Balkan Gate, which is the um, only surviving Roman gateway in Britain. Um, again, we could talk a lot about that. Uh, to the left you see a pub, the hole in the wall that was built on top of this Balkan Gateway. There were five, I think, yes, five main gateways into Colchester, but this is the only one that has survived, the Balkan Gate. It was bolted up, <coughs> probably um, because of the steepness of the land that leading up to it. It made it probably the most difficult uh, gate to get to. Also in the picture here is what we affectionately know as Jumbo, the water tower that was constructed in fact, it was finished in 1883 uh, in an attempt to bring fresh water to the people of Colchester, uh, Colchester town centre. Um, fears of all sorts of diseases, especially to do with sewage leaking into, into um, the water systems, uh, wells and whatever that they had. Uh, fear of cholera and whatever. This is very much a... Uh, a Victorian enterprise. So the great and good of Colchester brought about the, its construction. At the foot of Balkan Hill was um, a pump house, pumping system, that would pump water. Of course, we were into an age when we had steam engines, so we were able to pump water up to Jumbo. And there it stands in all its glory today, totally unused, and uh, as I speak... Um, there's a quandary as to what to do with it. Um, there's so much opposition to it being turned into uh, housing or or or, or a restaurant or whatever. Um, it's a it's a political hot potato. Should we leave it at that? Uh, so the Romans came, uh, they went, and we found ourselves in the Dark Ages, as we call them. Uh, there's evidence, clear evidence, uh, that the the colonia or the or the town centre as we know it today was deserted. I mean, what what can you do when uh, civilization civilization leaves you? Commerce leaves, no trade. Um, you can't grow crops in a in a town, so clearly people left and went back to basic living off off the land. Um, the town just decayed, collapsed, um, 
presumably a play, a playground for young youngsters to get in there and play around and throw a few tiles about, which of course has uh, <laughs> led to some interesting finds over the years for archaeologists. Um, moving on to the next picture, we have there uh, some evidence really of the Normans' arrival in 1066. Um, the William the Conqueror um, exerted his uh, rightful place as King of England. Um, Harold getting an arrow in the eye, and uh, presumably we know the story. And Colchester was given over to a man called Udo Dapifer, who we see bottom right there, uh, depicted, in, uh, depicted on, in one of our subways uh, as a mosaic. And he constructed Colchester Castle. Of course, the Normans arriving found themselves in, a, in, a, in an amazing place. Uh, a land built by giants, perhaps. Um, debris, um, broken down buildings everywhere. Um, as, I, as I say, there's no natural building stone, so they took advantage of, of all this and they very efficiently destroyed evidence of Roman Colchester by using all their materials to build the Norman housing, and especially the castle, which was thrown together with all sorts of different bits and bobs, hypercourse tiles used here and there, and uh, the bricks uh, and and whatever. Um, the size of the castle had to be big because they chose to build it on the site of the Roman temple to Claudius. And so it ended up being the biggest Norman keep ever constructed by the Normans. And of course, uh, something else uh, uh, that the Normans realised was, of course, the strategic importance of the Roman walls. So what they did not do was uh, destroy the Roman walls, which, of course, defined uh, this new Norman town. Uh, here also uh, is evidence of some of the Norman buildings that have... Uh, uh, survived not not particularly well, but the the best preserved probably is this uh, the Holy Trinity Church of this this tower here that uh, you, uses Norman materials. Although we are told that this is probably a Saxon church because of the uh, basket type window and the the um, arrowhead uh, entrance way. Uh, but also, of course, here we've got a picture of Saint Botolph's Priory or what's left of it after Henry VIII um, was uh, sorting out his marital difficulties with the dissolution of the monasteries, but this is what's left. But of course you can see the materials that uh, were used uh, during the Norman period um, for this very first Augustinian priory uh, that um, dates back to 1105 are... are Roman tiles and uh, the other materials that, that of course, uh, was left behind after the Romans left. Um, also, here is a map from 1610, John Speed, John Speed's map, um, which is probably the earliest map we've got of Colchester, a contemporary map anyway, and showing indeed the walls of the town and the various gates. Um, and the limited amount of housing there would have been in the, in those days. Uh, it wasn't uh, going to be too long after the, this map that um, another one was drawn for the siege of Colchester in 1648, uh, when a group of royalists uh, barricaded themselves in, really, into the town, and uh, uh, the town was attacked and laid to siege in a very hot summer of 1648. Of course, the Royalists eventually losing and its leaders executed um, in the grounds of the castle. So moving on to the next uh, picture, we see here the military. Now, the Treaty of Amiens of 1793 brought us 
into the Napoleonic conflict in Europe. And we went to war and Colchester sent soldiers and sailors. We've certainly got heroes from the Battle of Waterloo that we can uh, talk about. And some 21 or so sailors from Colchester who were at the Battle of Trafalgar with Nelson. Uh, but of course the, the Battle of uh, Waterloo ended it and um, it was decided that the barracks in Colchester would be uh, dismantled and life would go on as normal, but of course that didn't last long. Uh, it, trouble kicked off with the, in the Crimea in 1856. Um, we went to war again and it was decided that Colchester would become a garrison town with a permanent barracks. So we've got a picture here, an engraving, and of course this is pre-photography. So this is uh, the bird's eye view of the barracks, um, the, um, the garrison, the camp as it was called, uh, at the top of, uh, what would that be, Military Road I suppose, yes, um, where the camp church is. You can see the camp church there has been built, and of course the pub, you always have a church and a pub associated with barracks, one to worship and one to uh, have a drink afterwards. Um, and that would have been the Cambridge Arms there. You, you can possibly see uh, or not. But of course, in the goodness of time, this barracks became a brick-built barracks and it expanded considerably uh, into a large, uh, a large swathe of Colchester, which the town fitted around. And of course, many of these uh, these buildings, uh, Lakato Barracks, uh, Hyderabad, Miani, Miani, are just names now uh, with houses all over them. But I think they've been done, uh, the new housing's been done very sympathetically. And uh, there's a lot still to see of evidence of our military heritage from the Crimean period, perhaps the, the crown being the, the, the church, the camp church, uh, which was... Uh, thankfully taking over one of the largest um, timber churches ever built I think um, if not the biggest inset here we have uh, some of our town's uh, pub signs uh, which are a witness to our military heritage um, the grenadier the the bugle horn marquis of granby and the mortar royal mortar uh, and then on the other side, of course, we had a visit from Blackadder, the Blackadder team, in the making of their first wo World War uh, series, with Baldrick there in the centre. And in the background, uh, the cavalry barracks, some of the cavalry barracks, some of those buildings do still exist, looking for a good use. Let's hope they, uh, they do find a good use at some stage. So moving on to our final uh, picture, that of our wonderful castle, Colchester Castle. A wonderful, it's an incredible uh, place to visit um, with our museum in there um, and of course the castle park generally, the jewel in the crown of Colchester. Um, Colchester started off as, as Britain's first capital, its first city, which it's proud to shout about, which of course came about in the year 43 when Claudius arrived, which I, who I spoke about uh, earlier on. It's also the oldest recorded town in Great Britain uh, for the simple reason that Pliny the Elder in the year 79 AD on his way uh, to Pompeii um, and who sadly died as a result of Vesuvius's eruption, um, Pliny the Elder was writing a letter back to his nephew uh, conveniently named Pliny the Younger, and he mentioned a place called Camulodunum as being some 200 miles from a place called Mona. Mona, of course, was the the name given to Anglesey, modern day, modern day Anglesey, uh, from where the Aurora, Aurora Borealis had been viewed. And uh, Pliny was writing about this, so this gives us uh, claim to being the first recorded town of Britain. Our castle there, you can see we're looking um, from the south-east, 
um, at the Absidal End, which of course is a, a Christian feature of all Norman castles. Um, it's got a it's got a roof on there put on by Charles Grey. Uh, he thought it was a Roman castle. Uh, in fact, he was from the 18th century. He was given this castle as a wedding gift. And uh, he thought it was a Roman castle because they didn't know any different. And uh, put a, so he put a Roman roof on it. And that's why the roof looks like that. Um, the, uh, the, the circular bit on the, at the far end is where his... Uh, his library was. He would sit there, presumably, and read it through his books and uh, uh, out of the, away from his wife. And uh, <laughs> and he was responsible for putting these big windows in there as well, facing south. Of course, the Normans wouldn't have dreamed of putting such big windows in there. This castle was built as a fortress uh, to house a garrison, perhaps 5,000 men, who knows, with a drawbridge and uh, outbuildings that have long since disappeared. Uh, but you can see the construction of the the castle there together with certainly one of the Norman period slit windows used by archers to defend themselves against attack. So there we are, I leave that with you. Colchester uh, through 2000 years.